If you could guess which part of the planet has been titled the extinction capital of the world, would you ever think Hawaii? Now you know this, it might not be too surprising to hear that in September 2016, Hawaii became home to the world's first officially endangered bees. This is the story of the endangered Hawaiian yellow-faced bees and those dedicated to preventing an exotic extinction. These are always the greatest indicators of, of how the climate and the world is changing. The importance of bees is more appreciated than ever. So why do they continue to decline? And what is being done to preserve them? To find out, I travelled to the island of Oahu, home of the world's first officially endangered bees. Here I met Jasmine Joy on a farm set in the tropical mountains. Yes! Jasmine primarily works with honeybees as a keeper, educator and bee removal specialist for her company Bee Leave Hawaii. And how the bees turn the nectar into honey is they fan their little wings over the nectar and evaporate all the water that's in the nectar. She was my first point of contact on the island for learning about the endangered yellow-faced bees. Here's the heliotrope. Oh hi honeybees, sorry! <laughs> <laughs> so the honeybees love the heliotrope too. And all the bees are tiny, tiny little flowers that are perfect size for the Hawaiian yellow-faced bee. This is typically what the Hawaiian yellow-faced bee would nest in, something as little as this twig because they're very, very small. And over time, they've also nested in coral that's found on the beach. They are the only bees in the world known to nest in coral. After mating, females find a suitable hole to make a nest in then line it with a cellophane-like secretion. They then store nectar and pollen from flowers in there, lay an egg and seal it up. With no additional parental care, larvae emerge from the egg and eat the food until they are ready to pupate and emerge as adult bees. The main reasons for their decline are habitat loss and fierce competition with invasive species. Some invasive animals nest in the same places as the bees, resulting in fewer bee nesting sites. A major threat to the yellow-faced bees is the yellow crazy ant, named after their rapid, unpredictable movements. As well as stealing their homes, they will eat anything that sits still for long enough, even young bees. I went to James Campbell National Wildlife Refuge where my chances of seeing the endangered Hawaiian yellow-faced bees were higher than anywhere else, but also where I could learn more about the yellow crazy ant. Accompanying me was Dr. Paul Kroshelnitsky, a University of Hawaii entomologist studying control methods for the yellow crazy ant. Do you want to look around a little bit? For yeah, definitely. Bees? Yellow crazy ant, it just seems to exclude almost everything, at least when it attains the kind of densities that you're going to see down on the side of the refuge. These ants aren't native to Hawaii, and yet they have extremely negative impacts, not only on native insects, but other wildlife. And one of the things that the refuge here is really concerned about is the really devastating effects on seabirds, um, 
and, and also on other wildlife around the world. On Christmas Island, they, they kind of became famous for decimating the red crabs there. In here, basically in the areas where there's high densities of these ants, you don't see any of the native bees. Um, so they're, they're basically wiped out from that area as far as we can tell. Hawaii has uh, a single radiation of 63 species of Pileus yellow-faced bees. So what that means is there was a single colonist that arrived in the islands that then speciated into many different forms. Uh, currently, as I said, we, we know of 63. Um, seven of those have now been listed as endangered. The seven endangered species are Anthracinus, Longiceps, Facilis, Assimilans, Hilaris, Kuakea, and Mana. You can tell them apart by looking at the yellow markings on the faces of males, while females are completely black. In this refuge here, James Campbell is currently home to two of those endangered species, Hylaeus anthracinus and Hylaeus longiceps. This is Hylaeus anthracinus. It is the most studied species on the island, and also the only native species I saw myself, even with the help of experts. One of the plants that uh, they really like to visit is this native plant down here on the ground called a cocoa. Um, and you can see some, some insects flying around. Probably most of those are this introduced wasp that you see flying all over the place. They don't prey on bees, but one concern is that they might be um, significant competitors for floral resources. Because as, as you've seen, they like to visit a lot of the same flowers. Do they nest in the same way as well? No, they nest in the ground, so probably you can see all these little holes are, are their nests. Anthracinus uh, nests within um, empty, the uh, pith, empty branches, dead branches, um, so arboreally. Well, uh, Longiceps, we, we think, is a ground nester, so it may actually overlap in using the same kind of habitat as these wasps. In the 20th century, the Hawaiian yellow-faced bees were considered the most abundant insects in Hawaii. Today, though, they're very hard to find, but these artificial nest blocks have made it a bit easier. They have been specifically designed to house anthracinus by replicating the holes they naturally nest in while preventing the entry of ants. Around the base of this wooden block is a sticky substance that ants can't cross, allowing the bees to nest in the man-made holes without fear. The nest blocks are maintained by researchers from the University of Hawaii and the Department of Land and Natural Resources with the assistance of organisations such as Kupu, who provide valuable internships for young people allowing them to work alongside professional researchers and conservationists such as Molly O'Grady, an entomology technician for the Hawaiian yellow-faced bees. I basically do most of the field work. So I come out and I do a lot of the monitoring. I help to set up all of the field work projects. So um, I've helped to set up the nest boxes. I drill all of these tubes. <laughs> help Paul with scouting out spots to put the boxes and things along those lines. We've seen that it's pretty successful so far just after, because this has only been a month that these have been out and a, a lot of our boxes have had have had brood in them. So those are cells, yeah, that they've, they've started that they probably just put the pollen in. This could be an emerging adult that's ready to start flying out. So why is so much work occurring to save these bees? Why are they so special? I was lucky enough to ask Dr. Jason Graham and I took some of these coral and put them into small containers and watched it every day for a month and saw the bees emerge out. So we know that the yellow-faced bee may be the only bee that I know of that uh, nests in coral. He designed the nest blocks and has been working tirelessly to spread awareness of the bees. So he's probably the best person to ask why they're so important. The yellow-faced bee is important um, here in Hawaii because it's the only bee that's native to the Hawaiian Islands that arrived here before humans. Every other bee that is here is a non-native bee, the honeybees, the carpenter bees, things like that. Everything that now lives here on the islands had to get here from somewhere and they had to cross this enormous body of water to do it. So we think that the yellow-faced bee probably got to Hawaii inside of a 
piece of wood like this. You see all these little holes? In Hawaiian, they call those pukas, and the yellow faced bee will fly in, make a nest inside of something like this, and we believe their glandular material that they use to seal their nest is also waterproof. They were the, basically the first wayfarers that got from island to island by floating on pieces of wood. In keeping with this theory, it is speculated that after their arrival, they explored the rich variety of environments across the islands. Different individual bees eventually settled in their favourite environment and gradually changed to adapt to life there, resulting in the 63 species we know of today. Having arrived well before humans, they have evolved alongside native Hawaiian plants, which the bees rely on to gather pollen and nectar for food making them very valuable pollinators of endemic plants, such as a cocoa, a kulikuli, and now a paka, which in turn makes them important in maintaining the world's biodiversity. Biodiversity meaning the variability among all living things. Many of these native plants also hold cultural significance. So if you look at this flower, it's only half of a flower, right? There's also naupaka in the mountains, and so there's this Hawaiian legend that the flower that's in the mountains is also half like this, and when you bring them together, you're uniting lovers. This is called a kulikuli. It's a native succulent, and it puts up like little purplish pink flowers. And along the Alawai Canal, they have installed a kulikuli because there's so much pollution that goes through there, and so it filters out a lot of like all the bad stuff that comes through the canal there. Sadly, many native Hawaiian plants are now rare or endangered due to habitat loss and the pervasive growth of invasive plants. Their endangerment is a factor of the Hawaiian yellow-faced bee's decline. The nest blocks have been strategically placed amongst such plants. Some invasive plants grow much faster and bigger than the natives, so they need to be manually removed from these areas by people Generally, volunteers in groups like 808 cleanups. It's not just the plants and bees that are suffering from habitat loss and invasives in Hawaii. We know that the yellow-faced bees have received federal endangered status, but the very first insect in Hawaii to receive this same status was the Blackburn Sphinx Moth, another valuable pollinator for the Hawaiian Islands. It's a really big moth. It's excellent at flying. It has wide ranges that it can cover. So it is a wonderful resource for pollen dispersal for numerous plants, especially here in Hawaii where we have a lot of habitat that is really fragmented. So you need to have a pollinator that is able to access multiple areas. Christine Elliott is an entomology research assistant for the University of Hawaii, currently working on the conservation of this moth. People usually think about rainforests as being these critically endangered habitats, but dry forests are significantly more endangered. And here in Hawaii, there is less than 10% of the native dry forest remaining. Its native host plant, um, Aiea, Nothocestrum, uh, was found in all of those dry forests. But unfortunately, uh, people love to live in those same dry forest habitat areas because it's ideal for building your houses. You have all of the uh, wood that you're going to need for building structures. It's also great to clear for agriculture. So what does it mean to be endangered? What does that entitle the species that protection wise to receive? Since the species is federally listed, it's required by law that whoever it is doing the development gets uh, a biological opinion, how big of an impact it's going to have on these endangered species, and then that they come up with uh, a plan for mitigating those risks. My research kind of comes in taking a look at what is actually happening, happening with the population. Are the populations increasing or decreasing, and what are some of the factors that might be driving those population changes? So this is what it means to have endangered status, to be looked out for, preserving the habitat and encouraging study of little known species. It also helps bring much needed attention to them. I mean, news of the Hawaiian yellow-faced bees reached me on the other side of the world. However, there are still plenty of people who have not heard the news. I, I didn't really have any 
need to go into schools um, and do outreach and education uh, through the job, but I really felt that need kind of personally. I felt like I needed to share the Yellow Face Bee story with kids growing up here in Hawaii that may not know about the Yellow Face Bee. Some of the schools that I went to, I said, how many of you have heard about a Hawaiian Yellow Face Bee? And no hands at all went up, not even the teachers. The teachers hadn't heard of the Hawaiian Yellow Face Bee. Um, but we have mascots here, like the cougars or, you know, Spartans or different things that aren't really Hawaiian related. And they have this, you know, perfect treasure in their backyard. So although it is a very sad state to be in, having endangered status is hugely beneficial, especially when living in the extinction capital of the world. So we have these tiny restricted ranges. We have these high levels of endemism. And that means that we wind up with really little populations that are really at risk of endangerment and extinction. So while Hawaii represents 0.25% um, of the United States land mass, we have more than 30% of the federally listed endangered species. And these high rates of endemism and endangerment also lead to really high rates of extinction, unfortunately. And because of that, Hawaii has been known as the extinction capital of the world. Hawaii is evolutionarily unique, visually stunning, and has one of the most comfortable climates on earth. So it's a harsh, upsetting feeling to know its existence is being altered and the livelihood of its wildlife being threatened by our actions. In the past, little was understood about the potential dangers of bringing plants and animals with us to new environments. Environments they have not adapted to, where current residents, in turn, haven't adapted to the new arrivals. This lack of understanding was mostly due to the lack of study on the Hawaiian natives. Today though, we can thank Dr. Carl Magnaka for much of what we know about insect diversity on the Hawaiian islands. I've discovered, I believe, 13 new species of them. There's a couple of ones that I discovered. Oh! Um, so this is Mana and the son of Makaha. He's worked with the University of Hawaii and the Bishop Museum in Honolulu, and it's largely because of his studies that the Hawaiian yellow faced bees gained their endangered status. I got interested in the uh, the native bees of Hawaii. Very shortly after I first arrived there, I discovered them uh, nesting in some holes in, in wood at the house where I uh, where I lived, and found that there wasn't really any any resources for identifying them. And the last uh, real work that had been done on them was back in 1910. Um, well, this was in 1994. You know, I, I covered nearly all of the localities where they could be found, even during those pretty good couple of years, they were very rare, especially uh, certain species like the ones that are found in dry forests and in coastal habitats, which are among the most endangered habitats in Hawaii. Have you seen their population size decline since you began studying them to now? Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's a little difficult to tell exactly because um, they're very difficult to survey quantitatively, but it definitely seems like there's been a, a pretty serious decline in some sites where some of those rare species had been, um, no longer have them, um, due to mostly due to invasive species. So uh, things are definitely getting worse. Bees are threatened all over the world, not just in Hawaii and efforts to prevent extinctions are ongoing with the help of people like Rosie Erica in the UK. I work as a project officer um, on the Shrew Carter Bee Recovery Project, part of the Back from the Brink programme, aiming to bring a number of species back from the brink of extinction. So the Shrew Carter Bee, it has a really high-pitched buzz which is really distinctive and it's also one of the bumblebees that has a really long tongue so it, it pollinates particular types of flowers really well compared to other bees. So from that point of view it has its own kind of niche um, in the ecological world and we're doing a lot of work here to try and improve the habitat quality and also the habitat connectivity for this bee. 
as well as trying to engage with local communities to raise the profile um, of B and try and get more monitoring set up so we know we have a better idea about where it occurs um, and their abundance as well. You know, there, there's been a lot of uh, a lot of talk about uh, bees being in danger, and unfortunately, a lot of it is directed at honeybees. Or it's you know, people are talking about honeybees when they say that, which is not really a very productive way of. Uh, of thinking about it. Yeah, honeybees are sort of declining, but they'll come back, you know, they're, they're very resilient and, and they're things that we keep. And most of the pushback sort of against that narrative has been focused on, uh, on you know, so-called native bees, uh, especially solitary bees. And this was actually kind of one of the, the first examples of that being put into practice where um, you had a real world result of you know, recognition of the degree to which wild bees are endangered. So why is biodiversity important to the Hawaiian Islands and why is it so important to uh, control these invasive species that are thriving here? Well, that, that's not a a real easy question. That's not an easy question. <laughs> so there are a lot of different parts to answer that. Different people place different value on biodiversity. Biodiversity is important to people for lots of different reasons. It's wonderful to go out in nature to, um, to see all of the diversity in life. I think not only to maintain biodiversity, but also to just maintain culture of a place. A lot of times when you have endemic species or native species, it tells a lot about the culture that's here and, and how the landscape was used by particular people. When you have a very a monoculture, uh, where you have just kind of a field of one particular flower, it doesn't s seem quite as healthy as an area that's very diverse. The same thing with bees. The bumblebees do buzz pollination. These smaller bees can get into flowers that honeybees can't fit into. Some bees will use oils from plants. There's a lot of different relationships between the bees and plants, and I just don't think we understand it all yet. If we can bring back the population of this endangered species, I think it will show that we do have a chance to make this world a better place. Why should we treat any species differently? just based on how fluffy they are or their size. So why should a shrew card be, um, be any different from a panda in terms of the amount of um, work that we put into conserving them? Insects often have really bad PR. People mostly are familiar with the pest species, with uh, mosquitoes and with cockroaches and with ants that get into their homes. So they aren't really charismatic and kind of the only charismatic species tend to be the butterflies. So if you look, there uh, are numerous species and even subspecies of butterfly that are federally listed endangered species. However, when it comes to moths, there are only two, both of which are snake moths, which tend to be relatively large and relatively attractive looking. At the end of the day, all species are equal and they all have their particular role um, in the ecosystem and it is all linked up um, so intrinsically um, that if we remove something from that um, then that has a knock-on effect. We know so little about how ecosystems as a whole function and it's kind of like um, like playing Jenga. You can pull out certain pieces and at a certain point everything falls apart now I'm very abrupt and uh, you really don't you don't want to find out where that happens.